Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel, Kim and Chris. On today's French Open Round 3 catch-up. Novak Djokovic survives the scare in 3am finish. Andre Rublev gets dumped out in straight sets. And Madison Keys is ousted by Emma Navarro. Kim, today is the 2nd of June and we are here to catch up on round three of the French Open at Tennis Weekly HQ. The second week in Paris is upon us and we are starting to get a clearer picture of who might just be our Roland Garros singles champions for 2024. And although the rain has still very much been with us, this round has felt a lot calmer and a little bit smoother for some of the favourites, such as Carlos Alcaraz, Yannick Sinner, Igor Sviantec and Arena Sabalenka, who all cruised through into the round of 16. But it wasn't so smooth for the likes of Novak Djokovic, who endured a record-shattering late finish past 3am on Philippe Chatrier. Sasha Zverev as well, who battled back from the brink in a five-set victory. And Andrei Rublev and Madison Keys both crashing out in straight sets. Kim, it's great to have you back at Tennis Weekly HQ after your little dalliance, your little trip to Paris. I just hope that you didn't bring any of that Parisian rain back with you. Well, Joel, I'm back in the UK and I've woken up to bright sunshine outside. (laughs) So I think it's very much the case that the rain has been left in Paris. Although I think the rain's just going full stop because I think the forecast is looking up uh, for the tennis. So I think the rain delays are very much... It can't get any worse, I don't think. Well, exactly. It's been one of the most affected slams, I think, by rain in in many years. And... um, you know, the, the organisers have really had to be flexible with the schedule, haven't they, to get matches done on time, you know, ready for the next day. And and this is this is with two roofs as well. It's it's not like the days of Wimbledon when there was no roofs at all and, you know, we were wondering if we were going to go into like a, th- a third week of a Grand Slam. But the fact that the schedule has been like so ravaged by the weather, despite having two roofs to at least guarantee some action every day um yeah it's been it's it's just a sign i think of just how bad it has been it almost makes you think the days yeah when we didn't have those roofs over the main courts like what what were we doing what were we thinking (laughs) (laughs) because it's you know it's europe in may and that's yeah a recipe for rain like it's just yeah I'm I'm just thankful we do have the roofs now. But yeah, it's been a bit um, gruelling for some of the fans out there with with ground passes. I think you can tell by like just what everyone is wearing, like in the crowd and on the court. Because in the crowd, everyone is wrapping up. Everyone's in jackets, scarves, gloves, hats. And then on the court, I, I don't think I've seen so many base layers being worn by top level tennis players um you know like even on the inside even in even in the indoor environments when the roofs are on it's not shorts and a t-shirt go-to weather is it no it's not our our summer sunny Mm. season of tennis hopefully the grass courts which are starting now as we speak hopefully that will herald a nice month long six weeks long of good weather in the uk at the very least for the grass courts but um we do have plenty of action that did still happen uh, out in paris including a late night finish because yeah, i guess one of the stories of yesterday is that in order to kind of catch up with with things the organizers did have to adjust the schedule on philip chatrier somewhat they did mo- move the grigor dimitrov uh, zizou bergs match on to Philip Chatrier kind of before Novak Djokovic's night session because they had to get that match finished off because the winner of that is due to play Hubert Hercatch today. Um, so that was moved on, therefore delaying Novak Djokovic. Djokovic didn't start his match till I think about 10.30 p.m. when considering he was supposed to start at 8.15, yeah. um, which I have to say, like, I totally agree with the decision that was made. But it's quite often... Um, I think the case that like the really top seeds and top players aren't affected as much with these range delays, but here's very much a case of Novak Djokovic certainly being impacted by, you know, all of the schedule changes and having to be inconvenienced uh, himself. Yeah, I mean, the the organisers, it was it was a smart decision, but it was also, a, I think, their, their hand was forced a little bit. And you know how I think with, with sometimes, I think, you know, broadcasting times, advertising times, all that sort of stuff, they want to have it as fixed as possible, but they just had to. They just had to get that Djokovic. Sorry, they just had to get that Dimitrov Berg's match on 
ASAP after the day session finished to get it done. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you wanted to give them as much chance as possible to rest up and get ready, um, for, you know, for that winner to come on today. And although, and although that, you know, forced the, the Djokovic match to, to start later, um, yeah, it was it was absolutely necessary. And it's just fascinating that, you know, we had an evening session with two men's matches and a three a three past 3 a.m finish 308 local time kim i know you just said a late night finish actually i'm starting to think was it an early morning finish well yeah and i think i mean certainly the fans that stayed that late i mean they would have had a, a great night session but um mm. it was just a very very late one because Djokovic's match went almost four and a half hours it was five sets uh, we've seen uh, Djokovic play Lorenzo Massetti before, which and that went five sets. That was in 2021 in the in the fourth round when when Djokovic came back from two sets, and I guess a similar kind of story today. I think you know he went two yeah. sets to one down and then absolutely kind of annihilated Massetti in sets four and five to get the job done. So I think um, you know gutting for Massetti again to kind of have a a close one with Djokovic, but I think this is actually probably the the awakening maybe that Djokovic needs to uh, hit, you know, to go into the second week. I think this is actually going to do him the world of good, perhaps. I think it is a bit of a case of deja vu, isn't it? Because I still remember back to that, that first, that first encounter they had in, in Paris and, you know, Musetti was what, two sets up. He looked like he was, you know, go moving towards victory. And then Djokovic all of a sudden found a couple of extra gears, came back and ended up in a Musetti retirement and you know I, I look at Massetti and I think he's got all the talent in the world that is quite clear in the shot making capabilities he has and and as I say that was all on display I feel particularly in the first you know three three and a bit sets um, but the longer the matches go on it, it just became a lot clearer that there was that's the difference between a player who's really really talented and a player like Novak Djokovic, who also is incredibly talented, but also has endurance, he has mental strength, and he has, I think, things that just Massetti lacks at the moment. And it just shows, regardless of how talented you are, it's not always going to be able to be the thing that gets you through. Yeah, Massetti fades fast, it seems. Mm. He doesn't have that stamina. And unfortunately, at five set grand slam tennis that's one thing you definitely need to otherwise you're just kind of out every time the matches go go deep especially against obviously the world world number one top player so yeah I think there's definite lessons to be learned for Massetti clear things he needs to kind of work on um because he's found himself in this situation you know three years on against the same player and um at the same tournament so I think yeah definitely things for him to to go away and uh, more time in the gym as well perhaps mm, yes definitely I mean he has he has matured a bit and it's I say it's great to see him you know Ill on these stages you know not frightened of the big opponents he doesn't feel intimidated and maybe he doesn't because of he knows that the qualities that he possesses but there still feels like he's a work in progress and and there needs to be other things you know, added to his game, particularly around, I think, endurance, maybe physicality as well, because four hours and 29 minutes, that is a long time to be spent on court. And, um, you know, it, it just sort of faded by by coming to, you know, coming to the end of that bagel in the fifth set. So work to be done there. But Kim, just on Novak Djokovic, you spoke about maybe this is the jump start that he needs potentially for, you know, him, uh, uh, Roland Garros to you know, find his form that, he, that has been missing so badly in the season and make a really good crack um, in, in Paris. Is that your kind of overriding feeling coming off the, you know, Djokovic coming off the court? Um, you don't think he's going to be jaded or tired from the exertions he's put in in this match, coupled with the fact it finished so late? Do you genuinely think, you know, sets four and five have kind of awakened the, in his words, the the inner wolf in him for potentially to set him up very well for the second week oh I think so I mean I've I've predicted him to win the tournament and I just <laughs> I just you know we've seen it before he's not particularly maybe had great form coming into mm. it but it's a grand slam which to him you know he views completely differently I think to these you know regular tour events even master series level where he's you know I mean obviously he's won a lot of both but the slams are the the next level up and I think he reserves that extra level for the slams and he's 
too much of a, a champion not to be able to pull that out when, of the bag when he needs it. And I think, like we've said before, you know, you can lose the slam in the first week, can't you, by getting knocked out, but you, you can't win it. You just need to get get through to get the job done. And I think having those early fights and battles, I'm a strong believer that they can get you um, fine-tuned for the the latter stages where you're facing those higher ranked opponents who, you know, can can bring that tennis and you're going to need to dig deep to, to get the job done there. So I think, I think it's okay. I don't know how that, you know, the late night might affect him more now than obviously years ago when he was a bit younger. Um, but we'll have to see what the schedule is for Monday when he'll be back on court again. So at least he hasn't been too impacted and is playing again today. Like, you know, some players are having to do back to back days, for example. Um, But that wasn't the only fifth set match, was it? That we had on Philip Chatrier yesterday because we had a day session five set match with Sasha Zverev against Talon Griegspoor of the Netherlands, uh, who's the 26th seed. This went down to the wire, a last set tie break, and Zverev found himself 4-1 down in that fifth set, a double break down. Um, what was it that meant that Zverev came back to win that one, Joel? Because at one point, it really did look like he was on his way out. Yeah, it did. I, th- I was I was sort of actually expecting the result to come through with, with Grigspor winning because he was playing so well uh, and he really had Zverev you know, un- under the pump. I mean, you know, Zverev afterwards spoke about those conditions being under a roof they are not helpful to him um it was quite an interesting graphic on on Eurosport showing like his the service speed the heavy conditions it just slows his serve right down he needs a bit of warmth he, ne- he needs a bit of heat in the arena and he just didn't have that and I think that's one of the things one of the reasons it it just made this match so challenging for him because in that you know in that first set he he just didn't really look himself you know I was so impressed with him you know, aside of all the other shenanigans and, and things that are going off off court, I was so impressed with the level of tennis he brought in in the Rafa match. But that just was not on display. Um, you know, at the very start of this match, and I was just sort of wondering, you know, when is that when is that going to, going to arrive? And um, I think you know, you look at Zverev, you look at his five set record, it's very very impressive. I mean, he's now nine and one. Um, in five sets, uh, in matches that go five sets at Roland Garros. And again, similar to, to Novak Djokovic, I think his endurance and just, you know, sticking with it and never giving up until the, you know, the, 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 you know, the final point, I think is very important. And I think that's very, very crucial against players like Talon Grigsbore, who might not have necessarily had the experience at this level and, you know, you sense that, yeah, he was getting tight, uh, you know, in that fifth set. The closer he got to, you know, potentially career-changing victory, it, it, it the, you know, the burden became too much. And for Griegs boy, it sort of went from a time where coming onto the court, he would have been a player with almost nothing to lose against, a, you know, the so-called favourite, to a position where actually he had everything to lose. And um, I think that pressure really told on him. Zverev sensed it got his act together, particularly his forehand, and, um, you know, cashed in and played an impeccable final championship tiebreak. Yeah, Griegspor never having reached the last 16 in a major or beaten a top 10 opponent. So I Mm. think the fact that he'd never got over those hurdles mentally, it just made it seem like this, you know, can I actually do this? It's, It's, I've never done it before. And I think, unfortunately, that really did show and the nerves took over a bit. So a bit of Greeks were losing it and Zverev kind of knuckling down to up his level towards the end and, and come back in that last set. Um, and obviously in the context of the court case into the domestic abuse allegation, which which began, I think, uh, the day before, um, you know, he doesn't need to be there present at the court, but it's it's ongoing kind of throughout this period and, you know, kind of overshadowing um, his his time in, in this event and, you know, on the tour. Um, do you think Zverev is still looking like a contender for the title based on this, this you know, hiccup of a match, I suppose? I think so. I think if, if the weather conditions are getting better and uh, I think if the roof kind of is, if he doesn't have to play all his matches in these types of environments where, as I say, he doesn't feel at home as as much um then i certainly think that's going to play into his hands i think he has holger runa next so that is also going to be quite a fight i mean runa's also already had his fights i think to get to to this stage and he's had a a very epic five setter in in the bank as well so um 
I think with the conditions and you know how potentially the the you know the weather is is turning for the best, I think that could play into Zverev's hands. And um, the fact that he had that raffle win, I think it's it sets him up. I think he's motivated, and regardless of all the things that are happening, I think it's just going to be key of, in his view, probably not that letting be a distraction to his his tennis on the court. Yeah, and some other results uh, coming out of, of the last round. Kasper Ruud is through against Echeverri in, in four sets. Uh, Holger Rune, like you said, is through. Had He had a straight sets win this time round over Kovalik of Slovakia. Uh, Daniel Medvedev still going strong. Mm. Uh, he Klaivedev. came through. Klaivedev is perhaps here, but he beat Thomas Makac, who has been, you know, in quite good form, beat Novak Djokovic like yeah. a week ago. Uh, Medvedev beating him in, in four real sets. I think that was a good skin. win. Yeah, real yeah. banana skin. I mean, Greek Spore and Mahac, very, both, I think, both banana skins. And um, they were, you know, Medvedev and Zverev were, you know, very good to come come through. And I actually thought Medvedev was sort of going into this match. I, I was sort of wondering, is he actually the favourite? Is he not? Um but yeah, he was very impressive in the in the first you know two sets because Mahach wasn't going away. He was sort of like fighting with his box um, at a few moments. So I, th- I thought that sort of played into Medvedev's hands um, a little bit. You know, it wasn't the prettiest match, I think, from Medvedev. I mean, he struck 53 winners, but also 50 unforced errors. And again, it was sort of a case of him just, you know, coming through, riding the storm, particularly in that third set, when, which he lost um, 6-1. And, um, you know, I think it's quite interesting because I, I don't know about you, Kim, but I feel like Medvedev, he's sort of being overlooked to me in this in the draw so far. We're not really speaking about him. You know, he went out, out in, in round one last year. That might be a factor in it. Also, the fact that he's not really had a great clay swing so far. There's no big title like last year where he won in, where he won in, in Rome. Do you think he's being unfairly you know, under, underlooked or, or, or under, undervalued? And you know, could that could that potentially be a, an advantage to him? I think so. I think he's sort of um, a bit of a dark horse, even though he's one of the top, top seeds. You mm. know, you wouldn't normally put someone in that position as a dark horse. But, yeah, no one's really picking him or talking too much about him. And I feel like, yeah, he could be a sneak surprise winner if, if others fall by the wayside and we get a sort of a... Maybe a surprise finalist and Medvedev goes in as the more experienced contender. It's Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if he ironically picked up a clay court slam <laughs> as his next one. But I mean, I don't know. Maybe we're getting way too ahead of ourselves. Still a long way to go. I, I did enjoy uh, you know his opponent, Mahach. I mean, the best thing he did in that match, he hit two left-handed forehands very early on to break Medvedev. I encourage all of our listeners to go on social media to, to watch to watch those shots because it was incredible like just to sort of just casually switch uh switch hands and produce two moments of brilliance was unbelievable yeah you don't often see that i mean i know i i know maria sharapova i know has, has been known in the past to, to sort of break out the the left-handed forehand but um yeah it was impeccable almost as impeccable i think as his shorts which i feel like he just stole from Holger Rune or maybe they have the same tailor because uh, they were very, very short. Short shorts. I mean, yeah, you've put on our little notes here, Mahatch's shorts. And I thought I didn't actually see what shorts he was wearing <laughs> myself because I was traveling when this match was on. Mm. Um, Showing off thought, a lot of leg. I want to know leg. what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not like Stan the Man shorts when he uh, he won those those famous shorts. Um, just on the men's side as well. Another kind of thriller yesterday, Taylor Fritz and Tanasi Kokonakis. That went five sets. Uh, Kokonak is trying to stage a uh, comeback from two sets down, but yeah, not not able to get the job done. Taylor Fritz coming through 6-3 in the fifth set. That would have been a, a really fun match on the outside courts um, for sure, I think, with the, the various fan groups there. Um, and yeah, a, well, women's side of things had a few, a few surprises, I think it's fair to say. Madison Keys, my yeah. finalist, Joel. She's out. I know. She is unfortunately out to Emma Navarro, fellow American. Well, you know, Emma Navarro, she saw Jessica Begula not in, in Paris and was like, I need to do this for all the billionaire trust fund kids out there. And was like, right, I'm, I need to step up here. Uh, no, um, no, great, great victory, I think, for Emma Navarro. And, you know, it could be, you know, it could be a breakthrough, I think, victory for her because, you know, she's a player who I think there was a lot, a lot of hype, a lot of interest, I think, particularly around her at, at the start of the season. And, 
I think we were sort of waiting for a, you know, a moment like this because I think last season she showed the, she had this this ability and this you know this threat and this presence on on the court and um you know she needed a you know she needed a victory like this to just kind of bring that all to to fruition and I think to do that against a fellow American a fellow American who's having a really good clay season you know up there with with Danielle Collins um yeah very very impressive and uh, you know be interesting to see how she kicks on I think it's a little bit late for Olympics Olympic spots um I, th- I think she's still a bit of a touch behind but um a great victory nonetheless yeah I think in, it was two tie breaks and I think she was just more composed in those tie breaks and um you know channeling the kind of the power that Madison Keys brings and um you know using that against her and I think she's up against Sabalenka next uh, who I think she beat earlier in the season so mm. it could be quite an interesting one Sabalenka herself came through against Bedosa in in straight set so um I mean, that oh, very you know. easily could have gone to three I mean I, I, mm. flicked, I put it on the tv when uh, Bedosa was was serving for it and I was kind of like I, I was like you know they're best of friends <laughs> I can't imagine <laughs> I, I was like well, I wonder what Sabalenka's thinking at the moment but I mean Sabalenka found a, another gear went up another level and she just she sort of just steamrolled that first set from um, a real deficit. I think she got like four games in a row to set 7-5 and it was sort of no looking back from there. But um, yeah, a couple of like moments I was like, oh, is this, this going to be closer than I had originally thought? Yeah, we're back in it also through in, in straight sets. So some of the top seeds still going okay. Uh, one of the top seeds, so Chin Wen Zheng, uh, she lost to Alina Avanazayan, uh, who is quite a young player still, Russian, ranked 70th in the world. But she's actually got this kind of really strange record where every time she's played a top 15 player, she's won. Um, And she's back into the fourth round of this tournament. She reached the fourth round here last year. And she... uh, She's through. She beat, uh, yeah, Zheng, who obviously reached the AO final Mm. earlier in the season and uh you I mean, know, like Zheng, she was like care. on a comeback trail in that in that third set i mean she was um you she was a double breakdown um in in the third sort of <laughs> like a zverev situation fought all the way back and then uh yeah lost it lost it in a tie break so uh, you know i think it'll be she'll be disappointed with not being able to to get the job done but avenya san is you know very 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 good competitor i mean she got to the third round as well um at the australian open i remember she yeah she, one of those victories against top 10 opponents was uh, oh sorry top 15 opponents was uh maria sachary um she did on that route in, in melbourne so um yeah she just seems to i think she just seems to love the occasion and love being the underdog and she thrives in that in that moment and um she just had a little bit too much for chin wen jeng in the in that final set tie break yeah, struggles to bring it the rest of the tour though, Venny San. You know, it's uh mm. she's she's a giant killer on the big stage, but she needs to do that yeah. the rest of the tour, I suppose, yeah. that's what she's working on. Um but yeah, it does mean that well, most of the top seeds through, but we do have yeah, Madison Keys, Daniel Collins also going out in the last round. So that's two of our collector set players as well out. Um Emma Navarro and Coco Goff, I guess, still flying the flag for for the United States on the women's side. Um couple of other results though uh we've had uh Alex de Menor come through comfortably um Francisco Serendolo knocking Tommy Paul out in four mm. sets do you see him Maybe giving a, might be do you see him that. do you see him giving Novak Djokovic a test in in round four oh, I don't think so I, no? I think Djokovic will have his number okay. yeah mm. okay uh but I mean another name to watch uh Mira Andreva she's still going through she's backed up that win over at Victoria as a renker with a kind of really dominant win over Peyton Stearns another American who's who's sort of out is she I mean you know we did talk about talk about her a little bit in the in the preview yeah. you know she's reached the fourth round at Sam's before at such a young age do you think she could you know really go the distance here I, you know the way she's playing at the moment the confidence that she has I think she can <laughs> I think um it, you know, it's funny I, I, I watch her matches and I think she doesn't necessarily have like an X factor, um, you know, like some other players possess, but her her core game is just so solid, and I think her opponents just have, just find it very tough to break her down. And although I was expecting, I think a little bit more from Peyton Stearns, I think she's better than 
losing two and one to, to Andreva. Um, yeah, she, Andreva's playing with a lot of confidence at the moment. And the fact that also she's got uh, Conchita Martinez, who was, um, you know, Muguruza's uh, coach in her corner as well with all that experience, particularly at a Grand Slam level. Um, I think it's going to, she's got really good, she's in a really good place, I think, to, to have a have a crack at, at second week of a slam again, um, you know, following the you know, Australian Open earlier in the year. And just coming to a close on, on day seven results, uh, an interesting scoreline in the Andrescu Paulini match. 6 1, 3 6, 6 love to Paulini, mm. uh, the 12th seed. Um, bageled in the third set, Andrescu there. Shame because we thought Andrescu might be on a bit of a comeback. <laughs> I think, you know, this was to be expected, I think, you know, with, you know, a competitor like Paulini because that third set. Andrescu just she just ran out of steam and I think that was to be expected you know with a you know a comeback you know with the the amount of time you know that, that Andrescu has spent off of court before coming back at Roland Garros um, it, it was sort of I think to be expected mentally and physically against someone like Paulini who's such a, a game competitor it seemed to seemingly playing I think some of the best tennis in her career at the moment playing really really strong um so yeah a bit disappointing but having said that I mean it's been a great comeback I think from from Andrescu to get to the third round I mean we weren't even convinced she was gonna come through Sara Cerebes Tormo in in the first round so to get this I think it's been impressive but it shows that I just hope you know it's not just coming back for the odd tournament here and there she needs to build up some resilience and strength to be competitive I think when you get to these moments where it is a third set you have been on court you know, for successive matches, you might feel a little bit jaded, but you've got reserves in you to kind of be more competitive than, yeah, she was in that match. And looking at today's schedule on uh, Philip Schatcher, day eight, uh, Sunday, we've got top seed Iga Svantec up against Botapova, uh, Coco Goff against Cochuretto. We've got Felix Ojeelezim against Carlos Alcaraz, mm. and then a night session of Corentin Mute against Yannick Sinner. I'm sure the French fans are going to try and yeah. <laughs> do their best to help Mute in that one. Well, they've got two. They've got two French persons uh, into round four, which I don't think they had any. They didn't have anyone in the in the singles at this stage last year. Um, Mute and Gracheva as well, who uh, you know won yesterday. I think she was first on on Suzanne Longley. She's also through to round four. So it's been great, I think, for the home French fans. If you've not been able to cheer about the Parisian weather, um, yeah, they've certainly still got some some players to cheer. But I feel, Kim, to me, that the FAA Alcaraz match is, 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 the, is the prized match, I think, on, on Chatrier today because FAA is playing well. I watched him, you know, defeat Ben Shelton. He dismantled the Ben Shelton serve. Um, across three sets, very very comfortable um, in 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 round three. Um, I I think he could pose Alcaraz some problems. I agree. I think that one's quite an intriguing clash. I'd love to see Felix, you know, continue to play well because yeah, it's been a nice surprise actually to have him performing again. Mm. And I think it's a really good test to see where he's how his level actually is up against Alcaraz, who yeah has, has sort of come through quite quite comfortably so far as well. I'm also quite intrigued by the last match on Suzanne Longlon, who but her catch against Grigor Dimitrov. I think both players have been, you know, her catch kind of battling through a bit this week, but, um, you know, Dimitrov in, in good form. So, yeah, I'm quite looking forward to that one as well. Uh, we've also got Danilovic, the qualifier, who beat Daniel Collins. Uh, she's up against Von Drusseva. We've got Arnaldi, Sitspas, and Clara Torsen against Anshabor. Any, any upsets? Any upsets? Do you think Torsen maybe? I've, I'm w- wondering if she can go further. I'm wondering okay. if she. I could feel like Anshabor is playing. She feels rejuve. I've, when I've watched her, I feel like she feels rejuvenated, and uh, you know she is a sort of player who thrives. I think in these in these environments with packed crowds um, cheering her on, and even though her form I think hasn't been great in in like tour level tournaments at slam level i just think it just brings something out of her we just we don't see that often as much i think on the on the tour itself and uh yeah i think she's playing very well mm, well we beg to differ let's see what happens today <laughs> uh but you're off to the grass courts i believe mm. at surbiton today for yes. ladies qualifying ladies qualifying uh itf 100 event at Surbiton. Bit sad because Andy Murray pulled out of the men's event, uh, which is a challenger level event um, at, at Surbiton 
yesterday. But yeah, the the ladies qualifying is today. And I'm very excited because I've already told you and Chris on our WhatsApp chat, I'm going to be seeing two players who have defeated Serena Williams today. Uh, any any ideas? They're they're play, but two two players who've defeated Serena Williams playing qualifying in an ITF 100 event on WTA Tour. Any any ideas? Any guesses? Oh gosh, um, it can't be many. I'm just trying to think. Recent years, May- maybe the player who beat Serena in her very last professional match, Ila Tomjanovic. Mm, Would yes. she be? Because she's sort of gone down a bit in the ranking. She probably needs to play very this good, level. Kim. Yeah, Tomjanovic is going to um, be there. She's she's probably the headline act. Uh, or she's last on. Last on the main court today, and uh, Harmony Tan as well Harmony is also Tan. Uh, making an appearance. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that. I mean, you've had your fun in Paris, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna have my fun. <laughs> the, the ITF court start ITF now. 100 qualies um, in Surbiton. Um, yeah, I mean, just just very quickly, I say Andy Murray did pull out of of Surbiton. Uh, it was announced last night on the LTA's social media channels. I mean. What do you make of that news? Given you know he what you know he wanted to go to Paris, he wanted to go and play the French Open one final time. Lost in straight sets to Stan Wawrinka, lost in straight sets with Dan Evans in the doubles. Like I'm an Andy Murray fan, of course I'm going to say it's worth it. That's what he wants to do. But from a neutral's perspective, I'm going to ask you the question: Was it worth it? results wise no but if he wanted you know one last kind of nice trip to paris to soak up the atmosphere and yep. and play the slam then i think fair enough um it's probably a bit more glamorous than serbton no offense to serbton it's a lovely <laughs> event and unfortunately this is the last time last we're having time, serbton, isn't yeah. it? yeah i need to go pay my respects well exactly yeah um final farewell yeah i think it's such a shame for serbton i think last year there was such a buzz around the event because of him being there and i think it won't be the same this year it's probably gonna be a lot quieter having said that if anyone's thinking of going i would still go because it's a great event and lots of good players still to see um but yeah i do think or maybe it's delayed the start of his grass season and affected him negatively for that and he might look back and think oh yeah maybe i shouldn't have shouldn't have done paris but I think there's there's other reasons to go to Paris, isn't there? So maybe it was that. <laughs> the, but, um, the rain. He loves the rain. He loves the rain. The Scottish the rain. rain in Paris. <laughs> well, let's take... Uh, well, enjoy Serpenton. We're going to take a very quick break now, but do stay tuned because uh, Chris and Alina will be here in the second half looking back on day six at Roland Garros from Friday, including Andre Rublev crashing out in straight sets. So do not go anywhere. Welcome back to the Tennis Weekly Podcast with Joel, Kim and Chris. And now I'm joined by producer Alina. We promised you a boulangerie would become Tennis Weekly HQ. We didn't find a boulangerie, but we are recording as close as we can get to a boulangerie. We are in a brasserie and they have croissants and coffee. So it's perfect. It works. Exactly. So we have had a pastry. We've had a, a croissant this morning, but we must cast our mind back to... A couple of days ago, when Kim and I were recording, we were sun drenched for the 30 minutes that we recorded, and then the weather turned, and boy, did it turn. We were then going back to see Casper Ruud as a bonus match under the roof on Susan Lonlo. And little did we know that the day was just getting started. The day just got started afterwards. So and many matches on outside courts. It was chaos. It, it really was, was. Tennis safari for me. It was a tennis safari. and. I stuck around with Casper for a little bit, but you said, no, it's time. I need to go and see my Argentinians. They were both scheduled at the same time on the yes. grounds. Very dramatic scenes for Echeverri, where he seemed like he didn't beat his opponent, but rather Rindanek <laughs> beat himself. Yeah, it was, it was a wild scene. And probably I think that will be my golden memory from Roland Garros, because it was a few moments of clear sky so we got to see Echeverry against a beautiful sunset when Grindeneck hurt himself and basically just had to retire. It, it didn't last long that beautiful sunset. No because... it was short-lived just like our glimpse of sun yes but, you know I'll take it. We'll, I'll we'll take, take what we can get definitely and then I came and joined you around the grounds. When I say joined you we did have rather different agendas because there were 14 matches didn't play 
at 10 p.m. And I think it was your mission to personally see about 10 of them. Whereas I just made a beeline for Bibi. I went straight to Bianca Andreescu. I was courtside for that. And you happened to be in this- Back to back. Back to back. Because court five and six, there's a gangway that is shared. And I went one way, you went the other. And I actually didn't even acknowledge you. <laughs> I just went straight past you. We were definitely on a mission. And when I speak on a mission, I'm always on a mission when an Argentinian is playing. So I really had to see uh, Franz Rondolo wrapping it up. And boy, it was nice to see him winning again. It's been a little while for him. Yeah. He's had, met, he's had support from other players. I do remember when his results weren't coming. Holger Rune did give him some encouragement, yeah. which was very nice. And Holger Rune was also one of the incredible matches that you got to witness out on court 14. That, that ended in a 7-6 tie break where Holger was down love five and 6-1. You were there for the entirety of that tie break. What was the atmosphere like? You, you live in, we both live in Copenhagen. <laughs> you live in Copenhagen. We both live there. And you've watched many Holger matches before. Describe the atmosphere. I think for everybody that has been on court 14, you know that it becomes a bit, it, it looks like a pit. It surrounded does. by way too many people. Yes, it does. <laughs> and it was just An like that. An amphitheater, but yes. make it aggressive. Yes, it felt like the people were just like hugging the entire court. There was like shoulder so many, to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder, so much pressure. More people standing than people sitting. They had difficulty letting people in. But in the end, you know, the atmosphere was just so crazy. And it was really hard to understand who the crowd was cheering for because they were cheering at every point. <laughs> The same people <laughs> cheering for both players because it was cheering for tennis, cheering for tennis. They were cheering for great tennis, but it was like such a great atmosphere. I was actually really keeping an eye on Holger's box mm. the entire time. You snuck in a couple of times before you uh, chatted with his mother. Yeah, I Annika. was. Yeah, I was in Holger's box before and we know how hard the encouragement and the, the support goes. And I think some serious that positive reinforcement that took him a long way. Um, I haven't seen Anneke particularly in uh, close to close to Patrick this time. Uh, maybe they were seated a bit far further up, but I did see Patrick sending some serious encouragements at like five love. And I was what was he saying? I was like, come on, you can do this. You're the best. I was just like, that takes some like serious delusion in terms of encouragement to think that you can resurrect that. Yes. And boy, it did come back to win it. And I'm thinking, maybe that's it. Maybe he just needs this like, you know, crazy uh, support from his team and his team is still very, very important. And maybe I mean, I'm that, yeah. that is a job for Patrick Borotoglu. He's the number one hype man, is what you're saying. Exactly. Well, he's very good at hyping himself, so maybe he's able to share that level of hype. Probably he with... has a recipe that has helped Serena through, and he's he's just uh, helping Holger through. And that is the match that will uh, keep giving. And the tennis. So we did talk about, you know, you're the best. He was playing against a player that not everyone would have been familiar with, uh, Kaboli. He's quite new on tour. He's, he's made some some interesting moves. He has. He's number 53 in the world. So when you say you're the best, <laughs> I'm not sure the best would be to fit that tie break against the world number 53. But having said that, this was the match that lit up the tournament in many ways. Um, it was the ticket. Everyone wanted to be there. From Love 5 down, I do believe that in press, Holger said afterwards that he actually just thought about that match with, uh, uh, what was it, Tenny Sangrim, who was saying that against Djokovic at the Australian Open when Federer was down and down and down, I think seven match points or something crazy, and he came through and he just thought be more Federer. So combined with the hype of Patrick Mortoglu and be more Federer, it's hard to go wrong, but he, he did manage to come through. You saw the change, you saw the comeback. Did he up his level or was it a case that being in the situation for the first time, Kaboli wasn't able to handle the pressure? I think Kaboli started making mistakes and it was just a matter of who's who's dealing better with the pressure. And is that, you know, that 1% that we see in players like Federer, players like Djokovic, that can just flip it back in the last minute when everything seems lost. 
they have the, the, the clearness of mind and the confidence and the, the, the power to just pull through. And with a player like Koboli, I mean, the crowd was great. There are a lot of Italians in the crowd, but, you know, he's just, he's just a bit greener in situations like this. And, and I think that, that makes a difference. It does make the difference. You're saying greener, but you are fully dressed in green. So I'm very distracted by that. <laughs> Uh, but other matches that we saw, so as I said that I was at Bianca Andreescu and this was a very big match, but the thing that was probably the standout for me, obviously the performance was brilliant, but I was you actually... You got, yes. you got serious competition in cheering there, right? I did, but it wasn't from a place that I thought it would be. It was really was quite a surprise because I was sitting right at the end of court five and opposite me was Yannick Sinner. Who himself. Was himself, the world number two uh, in the live rankings, world number one. And he was cheering on his girlfriend, Karen Skaya. And so I was thinking, I've never really been in a situation where someone that we'd quite like to speak to is actually public enemy number one for me at that moment. <laughs> when he's uh, cheering on this support for Anna, and I'm kind of like, come on, Bianca, you can do it. And um, That was an interesting situation, and it's one for the books. It was, it, it was something very memorable. And he stuck around until, I think, about 10.30, 10.45, he was playing on Philip Chatrier the next day. Um, and he, he was cheering, he was vocal, he was very much in her camp. And as he left, he did sign an awful lot of balls, but he was very carefully protected uh, in, in that corner. But again, not, not on my bingo card that I would be actively combating Yannick Sinner in cheering on court number five at 10.30 p.m. at the French Open. But we embrace it, and Bianca embraced the stage as well. She did lose that first set at 6-1 before she turned it around. The level was good, the competition was great. And I just felt like in those key moments, she was more mentally tough and she wanted it more. And when it comes to wanting it more, I think that does get you very far. And I think that probably was the same with Holger. In these epic five setters and close three setters that we saw on that very chilly evening in Paris, you really had to want to be there. And it was the players who would play on a parking lot in December at minus two degrees to get that win. And those are the players that did come through. It also wasn't my only boyfriend encounter that I had. We will talk about this a bit later, but I watched Katie Bolter play, sat next to Alex Devon Hart. So um, I'm not sure what it is, but I seem to find myself in these sorts of situations. But on that side, we were both cheering the same team on in terms of Heather and Katie. So that was more comfortable, um, I have to say, than the Yannick Sinner situation. It's like both sides, you see, like cheering against the boyfriend, cheering with the boyfriend. You can get a lot more, you get, you, get, you get a lot more smiles <laughs> when you're cheering with. But how, Tell us how, how it was for you to see Bianca back on court and to see her at that level mm. and to see her being competitive again and seeing the smiles at the end. Yeah, it was, it was great. And I think the only thing I have to say is from a scheduling perspective, I'm not sure how you can leave it so late that you would end up coming back at a slam. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. I think she was scheduled to play the week before in Rabat potentially, and then she pulled out. So this was her first tournament in 10 months. So coming through against uh, Sara Cerebro's Tormo in the first round, beating Kalin Skaya, these are, these are good wins. Good wins on a clay court, tough wins. That's fantastic, but you just have to think, if she'd had a little bit more match practice, then maybe it wouldn't have to be such a problem-solving exercise. But to bring that level on your first tournament back was incredible. I'm such a Bianca fan. We know. The level was so, so high at times. That she was really, really firing herself up. Well, she fired me up. We talked about me cheering for Osaka the other day. <laughs> I mean, I was probably the most, most vocal that I've been. This is probably why you get a few husky tones from me today because I've not got much <laughs> voice left. Um, and even a little bit of Romanian oh, from you, Alina. Yeah, a the couple of were words. Out. Yes. Me and Bianca, we share some words there and some cheers of yes. support came out in our, our shared native language. Yes, and she did tweet us to say thank you for the support, which was very nice. I think that was another hot ticket. I think you were making the rounds as you went, watching the match points. You saw Holger, Casper, Bianca, and you even found time on that very, very cold night to see a bit of Mira Andreva, who took out Azarenka. Yeah, they were playing uh, right next to right next to Court 14. And it was a, a bit of a different story. It was like quite a quiet court. You could definitely hear Vika, <laughs> Vika's uh, cries. Um, but yes, it was. I think it was my first time seeing Miran Dreva play, and I was really like 
really interested to see her uh, movement on court mm -hmm. and how she plays. It's like such confidence and such. She plays with ease. She was playing free, and it it's was much easier when you're younger, right? Yeah, That's exactly. Two sides, two players at a different stage of their career where. I think Azarenka said previously that it does get harder as yeah. you get a bit older because you, not just physically, but because you know that the opportunities don't come around quite as much. Whereas for Mira, I mean, so much opportunity ahead of her. Exactly. She's so young, but she, she was like so good. I, I was like really happy to catch a glimpse of, um, of that just before coming back to see uh, Bianca wrapping it up. Yes. And then we decided at that point there was... Echeverry hadn't quite finished Windenet, but she retired five love down, just one game away from the loss. And we were thinking, should we should we pop over? But then at that point, I think it was something like 13 degrees. It was quite breezy at that. And we had been on site for how many hours? 14 ish? Yeah, it was, I think that at that time we were on, on the grounds for around like 13 hours. So we were thinking, okay, it's 13 hours of tennis. And we'll <laughs> be back in. We'll, yeah, we'll be, yeah, exactly. We were thinking, do we? Do we? No, we don't. But I mean, it finished so much later than the night session, which is quite unusual. I mean, we had that last year with Taylor Fritz playing at Rinderneck again. Again. And that went very late. So for us, we then thought, well, we've got to be back here in nine hours, so maybe it's time to go home. By the time we left, I think the only match playing was, was Andreeva Azarenka. And by the time we hit our accommodation, the match is like wrapped up. I think it was close to 1am. 1 1 yes, yeah. indeed. So if anyone doubts the commitment here at Tennis Weekly HQ, we saw it all. Yes. We and packed blankets, Chris. We knew. We did. We were huddled up sharing a blanket, <laughs> watching Bianca. And you said to, because I was very cold, I was almost shivering <laughs> from cold. You said, put your hands up. And I said, well, how can I cheer for Bianca if I do that? So You cannot cheer from under a blanket. You, you can't. don't want you to cheer. I, I was almost snapped back at you with that. <laughs> But then the, the next day, we did see some flashes of sun early on. And as we arrived, we popped straight on to see a player that we've seen play in Denmark. We've seen him play in Sweden. We've seen him play in uh, Argentina Portugal. and Portugal. Yeah. Um, Matos was playing in the doubles. And he was playing with Marcelo Melo. They're clearly gearing up for the Olympics. And we thought this is our chance to take in some outside, outside court action whilst the weather is a bit better because I do think that's one of the things that's so nice about slams is when you just wander the grounds and you're able to take in different things you don't necessarily plan your agenda and you go where where the moment takes you would it be fair to say that the grounds were like a doubles day it was because all the doubles had been we should have made this clear all the doubles had been cancelled two days in a row and even the doubles that had started had been cancelled from the previous day so I think that in order to give the singles players who had to come back the next day a bit of a, a lie-in because of the scheduling, meaning that they had to play two days in a row, the doubles did take centre stage early on, I think until quite a bit later in the day when the single started. But this was a bit of a surprise to us because as we were heading home in the cab, we were thinking that what Amelie Moresmo had said early in the day, there'd be five matches on Chatrier, five matches on Long Long starting at 10am. And we thought, who's going to be on Long Long at 10am? It didn't seem particularly likely, but scheduling was not actually shifted for Susan Long Long and Philip Chatrier. So it was normal play there, but the doubles did start earlier on the outside courts. So we took in some doubles, which was lovely, and doubles was the theme of our day. We did pop on to see a few of the singles matches, but the headline for us, and it has to be a big highlight for you, I think I'm going to make you do this at some point, peak pit and pleasant surprise that we do when we go away to tournaments. But Alina, we managed to get you in to see Sir Andy Murray playing doubles you have been close enough to hand a water bottle to players. You were basically in the man's fridge for this match. <laughs> well, we were in the fridge in Paris generally. That's what I call the temperatures here. But yeah, I was. We we were lucky to get quite close because that court was packed. Sir Andy Murray. Well, I was on a mission. Bring, he was bringing. I will say something, but yeah. he was bringing all the men to the yard. He was. It was he, yes. <laughs> it was a particular kind of support for him. Which a little bit merry, yeah. On the outside court, when you have such a big star, I think it does attract those who might not be the most hardcore tennis fans, as well as the people who have heard of only the big names. Yeah, it that's was a very, polite way of saying it. It was the very people, particular. The people was, Amy Moresmo wants to stop drinking alcohol. Those ones, that kind. Joel, if he was here. <laughs> <laughs> Joel. <laughs> um, yeah. So for me, it was it was great. Uh, seeing Andy Murray play, you know I get 
just the tiny bit emotional. Well, I actually wasn't, because I know that we both, and even like, this is uh, something that listeners don't know, we both do get hay fever. And when we were in Lisbon, you were like, oh, it's really getting me. And then I turned around, Andy Murray, and I just saw you like rubbing your eyes. <laughs> and Alina, a tear, a tear was in the eye because you have been following Andy Murray's journey for so long. And this was the first time you've seen him. You watched the documentary resurfacing, which you had the director of that on the podcast. It's such a powerful story. And he's such a powerful influence across tennis for so many reasons. And it was just overwhelming. It was because you get to see you know the story, you know how hard it was for him to even step on a court. He was like going through so much pain and, you know, dealing with all that injury in his private life. Just existing was hard. Imagine bringing it all together and finding that power to step back on court. Like really so inspiring, but also I do, I will always get emotional. So Andy Murray on court. So it was great seeing him play with Dan Evans against uh, an Argentinian and a Brazilian. But you were supporting the right side this time. You were very much on Sarandi's side. I was on Sarandi's side. Of course, I was keeping an eye on the on the, on the the guys uh, with whom we also spoke before. Yes, we have. We have spoken with, I think, both of those players, yep. Baez and Bild. Zibot Bild. Yes, indeed. But from that perspective, I think that you can tell just how much Andy Murray is passionate about playing tennis, that he is out there. It was pouring, pouring. with rain. It was so cold. And Andy Murray stuck around throughout the many delays of doubles matches, postponed days, starting, stopping. It actually meant that he had to withdraw from Surbiton to play the doubles here. He obviously really wanted to play. This could be because of gearing up for the Olympics, potentially, as, as a doubles partnership. But also, it's for the love of the game. You can clearly see that he was, he was having fun. He, he loves was the competition. It. We saw some celebrations, almost as though he'd won the match to break back when they actually came uh, came back from behind in that set. They were always kind of chasing. And I mean, who would have thought that I could be that happy sitting under an umbrella in very cold temperatures and the pouring rain? But turns out Andy Murray was the sunshine that we needed on that day because after that, it didn't get much better weather-wise. The weather just just kept putting everything away for the entire day. I think everything afterwards got cancelled on its own accord. Yeah, it did. And I think... Some of the matches did continue playing. We saw some players not happy with that. We saw Umber wanted to stop in his mixed doubles. I believe that Shapovalov and her catch both wanted to stop. So Simone Mathieu stopped. Court 14 didn't stop. It did feel like a bit of a, a bit of a shambolic organization at that point because rain had, well, previously rain had uh, caused stoppages for much less, um, even at times being suspended because the storm was coming, not because it was actually raining. And there we are almost in the eye of the storm and players continuing. That was very particular. And if you were looking, if you were on the grounds and you were looking at the app, it seemed like it was not raining equally on all courts because some of them... The site is not that big, but it exactly. seemed like they had different weather systems at work. Exactly. And it made me wonder, like, what is the reasoning behind and how is that decision being made? Who calls it? Is it the rank? Is it the difference in the courts? Like, are some courts more slippery than others? or the construction makes it soak more water mm, than the rest? I think it tends like, to be if both players want to continue. But we did see on a, on a side court, while we were watching uh, Andy Murray, it was Hugo Humbert playing. He uh, wanted to stop. With his girlfriend, mixed and doubles. And Ellen Perez and Matthew Abden did not want to stop. They were up, they were winning, they had momentum, they wanted to get it done. I think they're both doing double duty here for mixed and for men's doubles, obviously, Bob Harner's partner. And I think they, they wanted that match over. They've had so many delays, whereas Umber was actually down in that match. And I think it tends to be, if it's not working for you, you want to stop. But also if you're on the cautious side of things, when clay does become wet, it does become a bit of a tripping risk at times. So I think it depends most on the players, but ultimately a decision should come from the tournament, tournament director, tournament referees, and then supervisors will decide whether you continue. So we couldn't really understand it. We also saw Clara Towson. She wanted to stop. She wanted to stop. <laughs> she was actually telling the umpire that it's not fair for so many days in the row. Probably she just got a bit fed up with the rain and the conditions, like, come on. And on the outside it's courts, I again. mean, this is, if someone who's been playing on the outside courts wins the title here, they really have <laughs> earned it because it is a very privileged position to be playing under the roof, getting your matches done, um, avoiding the rain, because, I mean, this is almost, uh, it feels like it's, you're battling the elements as well as the player in front of you. And she certainly did battle the player in front of her. She was playing against Kenan, who you saw previously take out home favourite 
uh, Karen, Caroline yes. Garcia. Yep. And Kenan was not the player that she was. When it she was, was a different Kenan. A different Kenan. It was the Kenan that we have questions about every time. Yes, a very up and down Kenan in that sense. But I was, of course, us being based in Denmark, happy to see Clara going through her... You, your club mate, we have to talk about this. Alina yeah. plays at the same club as Clara Towson and Holger Runa. Yes. Can we say that we were Teammates? scheduled no. <laughs> to play after we, Holger wow. Runa? This is actually something... After Holger's practice ones? <laughs> yeah, Alina, Alina booked it and then she looked at the schedule and she saw that we were after Holger. I think he was having a, a home training vlog. Yeah, it was sometimes in the winter, in the winter slowdown. And so it's literally one one court that is his, his favorite court. And we didn't realize this. And then after that, I think we, I don't know why we had to cancel what we did. But I think for me personally, I'm not sure that it would be fair having, uh, having the court having experienced the greatness. I think it would be the <laughs> same court with two very different levels of play. <laughs> well, we would enjoy it more. We would have enjoyed it more. And what would we have said on the changeover? We'd have said, oh, well was done, it a good mate. session, Holger? How's the court? You're the best, Holger. You're the best. We could have kept a part How, of... How's the court playing? How's the court playing? <laughs> and then he'll tell us and we say, don't worry, it will make no difference to us. <laughs> we have old balls anyway. Yeah, exactly. Can we, can, can we borrow a few of them? But it was delightful, Clara. It's her first time through to her fourth round, I believe. Yes. She has been picking up some great form. She, she beat... In the Billie Jean King Cup, Maria Sakkari, that was a very big win for her. And it feels like those results that are for your team and for your country really do lift people. And she'll be very dangerous against Ons Javert, who we saw play against a quite inspired Leila Fernandez. She seems like she's warming up here. The temperatures may be getting colder, but Ons is getting warmer. Yeah. It was tight. It was two, two sets, very close sets. And normally you'd expect Ons to drop one of those sets. Yep, I think she just enjoys it. I think she enjoys playing here. I think the crowd is, is doing her well. I the crowd she... love her. I mean, yes. obviously the Tunisian connection. And we actually had, I actually had a lovely interaction with a Tunisian fan who reached out to us. Because we always say, if you're here, please do tell us you're here. So we went, I had a lovely chat with him. I was like, you're talking to me whilst Ons is on. You should be in there. He's like, you just don't know what Ons you're going to get. <laughs> And I'm like, I can relate, you know, I've been a, as a Hanshakova fan for years, you never know what's going to happen on the day. And, and the closer you are to it, the harder it is to watch sometimes. But this was quite, quite wonderful viewing because yeah. she did come through, she played well. And I think it's always nice to see Ons playing well. It's great. It's great. I'm happy to see her when she's, when she's enjoying it, when the results are coming through. It's a bit painful to see her when things are not going that well. We don't want to see sad we don't, ons. No, because we're like happy, happy ons. ons. That she's not the minister of unhappiness for a reason. Exactly. And someone who was or could be classified as the minister of unhappiness would be Andre Rublev on court. This was very dramatic, and I think we have to talk about this quite delicately because the display of anger and frustration that was on court was not only dangerous for those around, but also very much for himself. In the outburst that we saw this is not something that is new for, for andre this does happen a lot this seemed to be particularly bad and he did say afterwards this was the worst behavior that he has exhibited at a grand slam there was an incident where a ball boy sort of flinched at what was going on it was not pretty and he didn't get the win he did go out in about well, straight sets to arnaldi how much did the behavior of andre rublev overshadow the result that we got I think it's for us, for me personally, it's always hard to see Andre literally beating himself up because you do get an exhibit of what's going on inside his head. And that one is, is always hard to watch. And I mean, no wonder the results are slipping away when you can clearly see that he's not focused anymore. He's not at peace. He's still stuck on losses, on points lost. He's just not looking forward and he's... It's he's not, not on to the next, is it? No. It's very much looking to punish himself for the mistakes that he's made as opposed to uh, finding a way to, to rectify it. You know, the beauty of the tennis scoring system is that one bad shot doesn't end a game. You know, you can be love 40 down and you could hold serve, for example. And I exactly. always think that you do get those opportunities to get the game on the board, no matter what the score is in that game. Unless, obviously, it's a break point or you double fault, then the frustration, I can see why someone would bubble over. But this was a lot. Um, and it was, it was tough to watch. But it seems, it seems like a signature for an Andre Rublev match, unfortunately. You do, I do expect exhibits of frustration. And um, there are just 
the matches where he's not throwing uh, a tantrum or like getting mad at himself is are very like few right now. And right. I'm I'm just wondering how is he, how much focus is on the on the psychological side? And I'm I'm sure he's doing a lot of work with the team, but this cannot go on. It's valid, not only on a personal level, but also spectators do not enjoy it. He's quite a popular player. The French crowd did turn on him because they do not like this. It's not very, it's not in the spirit of the game. And I think that's that's a big issue there. And we always talk about this, you know, it's mantra play for the kids. There's this big um, sort of I mean, juxtaposition between the player that people see him as um, in terms of off the court and the personality and what we see on the court. And I think that that's something where hopefully the player that we see off the court can be much more present when he is playing matches because it's got to change and I hope that he does get the help that he needs. But we shall move on to some of the other matches that we saw. We also saw that Sitsipas made it through. He played very well. He was also out with Susan Longlong. He came through pretty comfortably. That was a straight set win. There were also straight sets wins for Iga Sviontek, her first match since that Iga clash. It was business as usual. She played a very high level. We were thinking, will the scare have maybe shaken her in some sort of a way? It was. It really didn't. She was back on and back on form. Yeah, it was, as you said, business as usual. And it seemed that the, the expected players got it done. They did. Yeah, but I was I was not particularly surprised uh, to see Ega just going going back so so easy. I think the the, the lessons were learned. Yes, indeed. The, the mind was balanced afterwards, yeah. and she was just back being eager. Yeah, and I did kind of I loved and press when she was asked about the, the footage that you may have seen that was actually circulating. The tears. The tears. The so really zoomed in on her. She was lying down and she was crying in the gym, um, which is actually I'm thinking this Taylor Swift lyric. I'm down bad crying at the gym. <laughs> so she was a Taylor Swift fan. So maybe it was like life imitating art, and or art imitating life, whichever way you look at it. And um, she asked why that was happening. She said, maybe it's because there are cameras in the gym, which I thought was kind of wonderful. You know, we weren't the biggest fan of the, the, the way she addressed the crowd afterwards last time, but she's definitely won us back over with that comment because she put that journalist in their place and they had no business asking her about that moment, even though it was, I mean, broadcast. It seemed invasive, did not like it, but she handled it well. She handled it well and she actually came back after that line. I think she, she had that one liner prepared yeah. so well i think she did maybe someone <laughs> prepped her for it you know that's perfect because she came back with an answer and saying yes it was a f she felt on edge it was a lot of like emotional load there and it really she felt was like she was about to lose and she just like needed to to let it out and other results that we have to bring you from that day we also had wins for Yannick Sinner coming, coming through in four, uh, three sets, very comfortably. I was saying four because all the sets were 6-4, 6-4, um, The late night watching Kalinskaya did him no bad at all because he breezed through with Kalinskaya, this time supporting him on the uh, sidelines. Coco Goff came through against Yastremska. She's getting stronger as the tournament progresses. And we have to finish on Charlie Alcaraz, who did come through. He's looking a lot better. He took out Seb Corder very comfortably in straight sets. He was happy with his performance. Were you happy with his performance and his progress from Carlos? Absolutely. We are delighted to see Carlos back uh, back in shape and finding the form. Especially Seb Corder can be dangerous at points. Very dangerous. I mean, it's you. You don't know what he's gonna bring. Just like he uh, doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. Just like, uh, I think, for me at least, is a surprise to see uh, Quentin Mouté so far. Is, yes. What is he bringing? Well, we have to be very candid here and be honest that at this point, I think it was something like 8 p.m. It had been raining all day. We'd been on the outside courts battling the elements. We were cold to the bone and we, we saw that there was a schedule change. And we thought, will it be Felix Oja Aliasim and Ben Shelton under the roof of Susan Long Long? It was not, it was Koita Mute versus Ofna. And we have to admit, we weren't, we weren't prepared to go the extra mile for that one. So we took our leave, but he managed to leave the French crowd wanting more. And he's made it through to the fourth round, which no one saw coming. No, it, it's, it's a surprise for me. I saw so many different sides of Mute in my uh, 250 tours. 
that I did not expect him doing so well. But also, I think his matches were scheduled on the big courts. I think getting that kind of support from the French crowd... Without the he, support, I'm not sure that he, he would have... Yes. gets on the 250 tour. Or the Challenger tour, in or many the, ways. Mm. Exactly. Um, but now we must wrap this up, Alina. It's been absolutely fabulous being here in Paris with you. There's a little bit of sun coming through now, so just in time for us to take our leave. But I have to ask you what your peak pit and pleasant surprise is. We'll do this in speed form, listeners, <sighs> from the trip. I think for me, I mean, my peak is very obvious. It has to be courtside. Maybe we do them together, a shared peak pit, pleasant surprise. It's got to be when Alina managed to secure the box on Philippe Chatrier. <laughs> that was in a box thing. come find me text I'm going to have to print that off and send it to you or something for, <laughs> for a birthday present what about your you can do the pleasant surprise I think my pleasant surprise was definitely seeing Sir Andy Murray oh it's got to be yes the conditions were not with us but we battled through yes. together with Andy which made it even more um, memorable Yes, and I think that Alina was pleasantly surprised that my mood was so good during those <laughs> very wet moments because before I'm not sure I was the, the happiest camper. And then wrapping it up, what was our pit? Well, I think it's got to be it's got to be the weather and the conditions. It was such a different I feel like it was literally the opposite of last year's French. It was Open, a heat wave. Where, where we were on a heat wave yes. and it was like so warm. We were like Packing on sunscreen and everything. I bought and linen with me to Paris this year, Alina. <laughs> yeah, the linen was not worn. The linen or was not worn. it was like the closest to the skin layer. Yes, it was, exactly. It was the base layer. It was yes. the base layer, our base summer layers. outfits. Yes, it's almost like it's the Oct it's colder than the October edition. Exactly, while well, Copenhagen and Stockholm are like cruising at 24 degrees. Well, listeners, I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode of the Tennis Weekly podcast. Remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all the action over the next couple of weeks, or should I say week, from Roland Garros, and hopefully the weather will be improving. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all major podcasting platforms out there. And if you like what you're hearing, then make sure to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also follow us on social media or email the show. We are on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and X with the handle at Tennis Weekly Pod. You can purchase Tennis Weekly merch at etsy.com slash shop slash Tennis Weekly Podcast. You can email the show tennisweeklypod at gmail.com. Or check out our website, tennisweekly.co.uk. And we'll be back on Monday at Tennis Weekly HQ for our round four catch up. So I hope you can join us for that. And it's goodbye from Joel and Kim. It's goodbye from Melina. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. We will see you again soon. <laughs>